Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Coach's Corner. Tonight, we're going to talk about boxing in armor. Oh, we've got an echo. All right. Fixed it. Tonight, we're going to talk about boxing in armor uh, and more than just boxing. There's a whole bunch of different modern martial arts that uh, the coaches are going to talk about how they use those skills and translate those concepts into their heavy fighting. So as always, please drop any questions, comments in the chat on Facebook, in the comments. I'll put it in here and the coaches will do their best to get to any and everything you throw at them. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to disappear and hand it off to His Grace Branis to get us started. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to have you back on our uh, normal uh, Friday night. Uh, and uh, we're going to call this one Friday Night at the Fights. Uh, you know, great episodes of, uh, of boxing that uh, unfortunately aren't around as much, uh, but uh, they were really core to a lot of my boxing influence, uh, later boxing influence on, on, uh, in my fighting game. Um, this is my favorite episode. Anytime I can talk about boxing, I'm going to talk about boxing because I I use a lot of stuff out of boxing, not only to teach, but also integrate into mine. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll get the chance to talk about those. I will try to keep my voice down. Last time I talked about boxing uh, on a, on a, at a rum uh, on Zoom, uh, my wife had to come in and calm me down because I was just getting a little wild and crazy. So I, it is a passionate sport that I love. And, but I did bring my beer and, uh, and I even brought my refills, hopefully. And uh, we're going to make it a good episode tonight. And uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Duke Floki for uh, coming out and uh, providing uh, a tremendous background in martial arts that he has. Uh, Sean talks about him all the time. I look forward to, uh, to, to hearing some of the stuff he's done. Uh, once again, this is a great opportunity for me to learn. So this is why I love these episodes so much. And of course, we have uh, Viscount Tristan, who is, uh, has an incredible... Uh, background as well in uh, both SCA and in martial arts. So, uh, I'm, you know, the great part here is uh, I think we all get to, 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 to kind of talk about a lifelong martial arts that we've been doing and talking about lifelong martial arts. So uh, we have Viscountess Bess uh, and uh, her, her martial art has been the SCA. Her secondary martial art are asking great questions and, and making us think. So that's why I love having Bess on. So, uh, so let's, uh, let's start her off. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start with my background a little bit. Um, and, and then we'll, after we talk about the background, we'll talk about influences from each piece. And, uh, and then we're gonna get a little deeper after. Uh, the thing I would say is ask questions. Uh, questions are the best part of, uh, of the episode to tell you the truth, because it really enhances our episode and we love them. Uh, and uh, so uh, please, please ask. Uh, Keep the conversation going. If you learn something and, and you want to talk about it, put it in the comments because some, some of those even get brought, get brought up in the episode. So we love doing that. Uh, my background uh, started a little bit in jujitsu when I was very young, a couple of years, a uh, couple of belts type of deal. Um, and then, uh, then kind of jumped into uh, mostly uh, uh, tank sudo, hapkido, uh, kendo, uh, and uh, from Kendo, um, I, I kind of fell into the SCA, and that was uh, 90, or, yeah, 1989 or 7, one of those two. And uh, uh, actually, 87. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought I came in and I thought I was going to rock the world. Uh, you know, uh, Kendo is great until you hit a shield. So, uh, or you have to wear it. it it's, 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 uh, you know, that's kind of the way I started. Uh, and, uh, but I, I did bring a lot from each of those um, to the sport, some natural in the beginning, and then later some actually because I wanted to bring them in. So, Floki, what did you kind of, I'm going to catch Floki drinking already. Uh, what did you bring in? What, what did you start in? Uh, I started, if we're going to go all the way back to childhood. I started in Shotokan Karate when I was about eight. Uh, and then I did that for a few years. And then um, I got into the SCA when I was about 19. So this would have been 1989, 1990. Um, then I've done uh, Wing Chun Kung Fu, 
little Jeet Kune Do. I've done a little Muay Thai. I've done a little American boxing. Uh, and then recently I've been doing, working a little bit more with uh, Polish Sabre a little bit and some of those concepts and some traditional Olympic fencing concepts as well, some uh, modern fencing theory as well. So I've been able to, over the years, kind of drag little bits and pieces of those over. Um, a lot of body mechanics, a lot of footwork, uh, and just the way you're going to kind of how to enter fights, how to control fights. Uh, where your headspace needs to be when you're in a fight. Uh, they've all had, they've all helped a little bit. They've all helped quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree 100%. Yeah. Vin. Tristan. Yeah, I started in martial arts, had a passion for it when I was young. Uh, I got into a hybrid art called Chun Mu Kwan, which is kind of a mixture of a, a couple different arts. And from there, I went to, did that for about a year or two and then went to Shotokan Karate. Did that for another year, year and a half. And then uh, once I moved out and I realized I had to afford martial arts on my own rather than having my parents pay for it and uh, budget was pretty tight, I found that SCA fighting practice was actually free. So I got, that's right, I fell into that and loved it. Um, along the way, got into some uh, Muay Thai later on uh, after quite, you know, a couple of decades within the SCA. I had wasn't doing a lot of mundane martial arts, but I wanted to get back into it again. And so I found uh, Aikido, which I took on with a vigor and then also found some good instruction with uh, eight, 17th, 18th century pugilism, uh, things like Pancration, Savat, uh, a lot of the kind of older, more classic arts, and then uh, kind of merge those into, into my art, wrestling, stuff like that. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, Bess. Uh -huh. I can I can add to this. When I was a kid, I did judo for two years. Yay! All right. I have one, Bronis. <laughs> so I did. I did judo for a couple of years. And then when I was around 22, I got into the SCA. And then well, a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, and in 2014, I uh, did some Battle of the Nation stuff, which uh, is its own unique sport and a little different than what we are. So yep. I'm a little bit outside the SCA. Awesome. So one thing I'd like to make sure everybody knows is, you know, it, this is a scenario where it's, you don't have to come with a lot of martial arts background. Uh, and in fact, in sometimes those, I've seen people um, come in uh, with martial arts background and they tend to apply things too much. They don't, they, they, they rush into it. Um, they, uh, and, and really even inside those uh, many martial arts, don't essentially get to that point where you really go hard sparring. So, so the SCA is a, is a bit of a world of its own. Um, I have seen people that came out of band uh, actually grab on faster than people that came out of martial arts sometimes. And it's because they know cadence and pace and rhythm, which is super important to fighting. Uh, and the best part about them is they're open to listen and they're willing to start at the bottom and just constantly keep adding on and working up where a lot of times when you get a martial art, including me, um, it, you know, I, I, I struggled for two years. I could beat some of the best guys out there by laying down so much offense that they just could not stop it. And then some guy that just walked in would hit me and I'm like, what the hell, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, and that's because, you know, I, I was, I was being all natural and, and just, you know, I, I brought in this idea that I knew and I should be better at it and I wasn't. And it took me a while to step back and, and really start the learning of how to do SCA piece of it. So, so be aware, you know, I think a lot of us are, have a background in martial arts because we've always loved fighting and we've always wanted to be engaged in something like this. And so, you know, that's it, that's how it starts a little bit, but everybody has a little bit of that in them. And if it's the SEA is the first opportunity, welcome, because uh, it's a great opportunity. I, I've learned actually, I, I sometimes I look back and I go, I could never be the martial artist I am now if I would have just stayed with one thing. The fighting in the SCA brings a whole level of education uh, to competition and contact than, than most of my other martial arts I've been in. And, and 
you know, including Kendo. And, and I had an Okinawan uh, uh, teacher there and, and we used to go at it, but you know, it, it's still SCA stuff, you know, when you're, you're coming off bruised and battered, it, it provides you a different mindset. So, um, so uh, Floki, tell me what you kind of the things that you think early off helped from the other martial arts you had. And, and then, you know, let, let's just start, start off with like early, early beginning and what, what you brought in that helped you, you think, at the early career, part of your career. I think it's mostly, um, I think it's a mental aspect. It's the first thing that comes across because you're trying to, I mean, when you first start and you're coming from a martial art background, I never did a martial art before SEA where I was holding a weapon. I always was, it was always some kind of striking martial art. So I didn't right away understand how to translate, um, you know, say a, a, a right cross or a punch from Shotokan karate to a flat snap. It took a while to figure that out. But the mental aspect, the idea that it's going to be uh, physically punishing to do this game, it's going to be spiritually and psychologically daunting. I think people who, who have a little martial arts experience, and this is actually true too with people who have athletic experience. I've trained a couple of my squires have played uh, DL for Oklahoma State. And I had another squire who played, I want to say, I think he played for Kentucky, DL for Kentucky. And they didn't have a martial arts background when they started, but they understood that to be successful, they had to be resilient, physically, psychologically, and spiritually resilient. And that resiliency is probably the most valuable thing that you get when you come in from another discipline. You know you're going to get bruised. You know you're going to get tired. You know you're going to have days where you want to quit. And you can persevere because now you know that that's part of the process. And for me, that was the most valuable thing that I think that I had when I first started. It took me about 10 or 12 years to really begin to translate more of the martial arts over to my fighting style. So um, I mean, I've been fighting for 32 years now. So it's not like that was, that's a little bit in the past, but that's a, that's, you know, at the time I thought, well, that's a long time to start wanting to translate stuff over. But if you actually think about martial arts in other disciplines, 12 years, probably right on the nose. I agree. Yeah. So I'd say that's probably the best thing that I have. I had yeah, a lot I, of ups and that. downs, a lot of ups and downs. I remember going home. I remember coming home from a fighter practice and throwing my helmet through a wall. And I was like, I'm never going oh. back. And this is stupid. I mean, I was 22 years old. So, you know, I was like, it's like, I'm never going back next morning. Didn't even, didn't even remember that next practice. Just packed my stuff up and went and everybody in my family, I was still living at home. And my mom was like, you're going to keep doing this after what I just saw. I was like, yeah. Of course, you know, it's like that's just part of the game. Yeah, that's it's, the challenge. It's that resilience. Yeah. Yeah. That's the big key. Yeah. Yep. Tristan, what do you got? Well, you know, I didn't do uh, a, really a lot of martial arts before I started because I started when the SCA when I was 15. I think I started in martial arts when I was about 13 or so. I did get a little bit of exposure to sparring, but not a ton really as the SCA gave me a lot it was like a heavy duty dose of what it's like dealing with a live opponent uh, but that said I did come in with a certain amount of even doing empty-handed sparring I did realize okay there are safe times to approach your opponent and then times when it's not safe and you have to discern when it's time to enter when it's time that you can do your strike without getting you know walking into a fist or walking into a kick or something and I that translated pretty well um, to the weapons. I realized the range is a lot different. Uh, obviously, now you got obstacles to get over, like shields and things like that, to land your land your blows and whatnot. But um, really, the big thing was, and with, with both martial arts and with with the SCA, it was kind of the same. That I had a ton of heart, but I was not a natural talent. Um, I, I was working with some people that came in at the same time I did. And I looked at them and like, well, how are you picking this up so fast? Like everything you do, you, you can get it in a matter of, you know, a practice or two, and now you're doing it pretty reliably. And I felt like I was just struggling. And um, of course I had the persistence to keep going 
uh, when they had kind of gotten bored and, and left, or they would say, well, I'm going to skip practice today because I'm already pretty good. And, and, but I was like, no, I suck. I, I absolutely am awful. I need to get to practice. I'm not going to miss one. I'm going to get to everyone. I'm going to yeah. fight at everyone that I can borrow armor for. Um, and that, that over the long term made a difference. And then kind of the reverse happened when I started picking up uh, empty hand martial arts after having done a lot of SCA fighting. And this is, I, you know, I always viewed SCA fighting because like, I'm having fun. This is a blast. I mean, I get to live kind of the fantasy, but I ran into many martial artists empty handed that never had decades worth of sparring experience. Like you put a live opponent in front of them and they don't even know what to do. And I realized that kind of like a boxer who deals with actual sparring work or competition work, and both those are different, by the way, sparring is not the same yes. as competition fighting. 100%. That is tremendously valuable. And there are a lot of theoretical martial artists that can do katas and they can do forms and they can work on the minutia of technical details of their technique, but they don't, they have not put that together in front of a live opponent. And, and that's where I saw the value of how they, how both SCA fighting and empty hand sparring and training those things layer together. To really make a, a more complete art and, and i'm not a complete martial artist yet still working on it but, for any of us but yeah exactly but you can see the big holes that happen when somebody does nothing but sparring no form work or they do all form work no sparring or no competition or even they just do sparring and i ran into this in my my younger days too but i do really well at a practice and then i'd go into competition and i'd suck like it was just, I did not compete at the same level that I, I practiced at. And I had to cross yeah, yeah. that bridge too. So that's, that's a learning, that's a learning place as well. Learning to win. Absolutely is. So that's a, that's a big one. Yeah. Bess. So I don't have the martial arts background that you guys have. So I, I can't talk about that. But Floki, you talked about the spiritual um, and the fortitude that a person needs and what I have done is I have run a couple of marathons, 26 miles. Yeah. And that is much the same thing. Uh, I can tell you after a little while, you start thinking, would anybody notice if I stopped or if I left? <laughs> you know, that's, that's, uh, it's very much the same thing. It's very much it is. To practice week after week to be able to run the 26 um, was hard. And here's the thing. Um, I was not a runner. I decided it was about this time of year. I was living in Montreal and Montreal has the Montreal Marathon in September. I thought I should run the marathon. I was 18 or 19 and I thought, how, how hard can it be? <laughs> so I set out to, you know, in eight months or less to go from being a non-runner to being a runner to completing a marathon. And uh, that's the sort of thing. So I do want, Bronis, as you said, if you don't have the martial background, Many people have other backgrounds that will come into the SCA in some ways. I also jumped out of a plane just once because that was enough. But th those are the sorts of things that teach you courage and give you the, the mental fortitude. So if you're listening to these guys, and I know I am thinking, holy crap, they're amazing with all the things that they're doing. I would venture to say that many people who watch this have done something that will contribute to their SCA fighting that they may or may not think counts, but it does. So, you know, and, and let's just expand on that a little bit. It's interesting. I was uh, reading a book and on, uh, it's The Art of Learning and uh, by Josh uh, Waltzkin. Um, and I may have pronounced the last name a little wrong, but he's actually, the young Bob, or, uh, young Bobby Fisher, uh, he was based on it. He was he's a chess champion at, at a really young age. Uh, in fact, prodigy. he what's that? He was a prodigy. Yeah, he was a total prodigy. Um, and after that movie came out, it kind of destroyed him mentally uh, for a while. And uh, he ended up switching out of chess, although he still played and he still traveled the world uh, after it, a little quieter. Um, but he went into uh, Tai Chi, actually. And then from Tai Chi, his master recognized him as, you know, he, that he had something and, and put him early off into a push hands class, which is essentially a competition 
Um, and there's two types of push hand. One is moving and one is, is non-moving. And uh, he fell into that and he used all the same techniques he learned to defeat opponents in chess and how to analyze things fast and how to calculate because he knew how to do these things. He knew them better than anyone, how to break somebody down. And, and over a period of time, he ended up and it very rarely a outsider being a worldwide champion in both non-mobile and mobile pushing. Uh, and, and, and one, it was a co-champion because they, uh, they, they, they don't like outsiders winning. So it was, uh, it was a thing, but, you know, here's an example of a person that comes in with this super discipline. And, you know, this, this goes back to what Beth said, and it, you know, and, and the Floki said, and, you know, even on Tristan's side, it's like you dive into something and it's just like, you know, you, you use that resilience and that fortitude to keep doing it, no matter if you like it, don't like it. Um, you know, that's, that's the, you know, it's, it's like I had a bad day. It doesn't mean you don't go back the next day, you know? And, or you, you throw your helmet through your wall and it's a, sometimes that makes you go back the next day, <laughs> you know? So just be aware uh, for me, I, you know, I didn't realize it. And I, I think this is the, the uh, you know, Floki brought this up and um, I think this is a big part. Sometimes, you know, it takes years just to master the abilities you need and the physical skills before you can understand what's really happening. And, uh, and that was a, that was a big thing for me. I, I, I brought in what I realized later is a lot of my early skills were out of kendo, the, the bursting, uh, the falling, the following the sword shots, I could cover extreme ranges and I fought mace for a long time. Right. Tristan, oh, yeah. uh, my first, my first five, six years in the SCA. And, um, but I could be on people in seconds, people, and I'm a small guy, I'm, I'm on giant guys and, and in their shorts, everyone's like, you are teleporting. And all that's happening is in Kendo, you're watching literally for tensions in your opponent's bodies are creating tension so you could slide in underneath them before they could move and into ranges and with following a sword shot as you're coming in. And, and I look back and I'm like, that's where my, that's where, where I came from is that space. We did a lot of, I did a lot of kickboxing in my tank sudo because there was a, my, my instructor was was like a green belt, he opened a studio. Uh, I was lucky enough that he hired black belts to come in and do everything else. And that's why I was able to get him keto and other things. But he did train at Croc Gym and he'd bring every black belt into the building, and everybody who thought they were something and he'd knock them out in the ring over and over again. And he had the ugliest knuckles in the world, the ugliest ears in the world, uh, just because that's what boxing is. And, uh, and it was great because I got to learn that as well. We did a lot of kickboxing. We had a professional ring in the, in the, in, in our dojo and, um, and, you know, I woke up on the bench. It's it just the way it works. Um, but you know, that it just, it, it taught me that, that the pain piece, um, I wasn't afraid of being hit. And I think that helped me a lot in, in, in what came out of that. So, but, um, I, I think Tristan, you kind of dove in that, you know, you, you, you brought the SCA into your martial arts. Floki, did you do that? I, uh, um, can you guys hear me? Hear me okay? I just got a message. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, I did eventually. I mean, I didn't think that there was a place for it in the SCA when I started. In fact, I think I was sort of discouraged at the beginning. This is obviously back in the 90s. I was discouraged from bringing a lot of, of, of any martial arts experience I had over to the SCA. Um, it wasn't until probably, like I said, 2002, 2003, that I began to do that. Um, and my motivation for bringing it over was I wanted to try to incorporate more. Um, I kind of had this idea I wanted to incorporate more authentic medieval styles of fighting. See how much of that I could bring over to SCA heavy combat. And as I started to do that, I began to realize, I started to study the, the period manuscripts, the Talhofer, and like I said earlier, George Silver, and Paradoxes of Defense. And there's so much missing in those books. You have to kind of bring modern fighting concepts into that to kind of, I called it like the Jurassic Park theory of fighting. You got to bring the frog DNA in to recreate the dinosaur because it's missing. And when I did start bringing over my, my, my martial arts experience that I had, I had to change a lot about my fighting style. I, 
first of all, I had to change a lot of my equipment. I had to change a lot of my gear. And this is a big one when, when I train guys, I look at their equipment, they'll come up and say, hey, can you show me the, you do this and show you do that? And I said, not in those shoes, not with that sword, not with that yep. shield. It, it won't work. Because, because it wasn't medieval? Like, why would you say that? Well, I'll give you a good example. Um, I thrust a lot now in my style. I'm, a, I'm very heavy on the thrust. In fact, I lead with the thrust. Why is that? That's my jab hand. It's my jab. It's a long range attack that, yeah, I mean it when I thrust at somebody's face. Just like when I would jab in boxing, if I jab at somebody, I mean it. It's going to hurt you. But I'm not really doing it because that's going to be the KO hand. That's not going to be the cross. That's not going to be the uppercut. I want to set up the cross. I want to set up right. the uppercut. And I need to keep you at distance because I need to create a certain amount of tempo for me to throw that shot, to throw that jab. And so I suddenly had to start using thrusting kicks, which was a big, at the kingdom, in our kingdom, Artemisia at the time, that was a no-no. Um, the other thing I had to change was I got rid of basket hilts. Why? Because I couldn't hold the sword in a position that actually accommodated, at least for the way I was fighting, couldn't accommodate thrusting as smoothly. That basket hilt kind of got in the way of my wrist. So suddenly now I'm going to an open hilted sword. Well, now I have to come up with better hand protection. And it just led to this whole chain of events. Uh, foot, foot gear, what you're wearing on your feet. Oh, huge. Huge. Boxers don't fight in jack boots or motorcycle no. boots or engineering boots. They don't fight in a, in a one half inch heel. No. I fight constantly in a boxer's tripod. I'm always on three points, never on four. If I'm on four points, I'm dead. Um, now, Wing Chun Kung Fu, something I brought over. In Wing Chun Kung Fu, same thing. You're on a boxer's tripod. So for people who don't know, look at each of your feet and each foot has two points. You have a ball of your foot, you have the heel of your foot. You want to be on three, ball, heel, ball, but never on four. So phrases like flat-footed, that's what we're talking about. That comes from boxing. In Wing Chun Kung Fu, it's, it, you, you are, your heel that's up is your lead foot, is usually your front foot, not your back foot. And in traditional boxing, in American boxing, it's usually the back foot. If you're in an elevated heel when you fight, your heel's already off the ground, but you're flat-footed. And we're not talking, for example, and I know like kendo, for example, what do they say? Rice, paper, wit? Yeah. You're just, just. You're shaving the ground, man. You're, and it's the same thing here. You're not doing this really, you're not pulling the foot up. You're not really even engaging the gastric muscles in the half to pull that heel up. You're actually just sort of leaning your weight forward onto your toe. And we're talking my tiny, tiny bit off the ground. So I had to go to flatter shoes. And eventually, I just went to period footwear. Yep. And Me too. that made a huge difference in the, the ability to move like a boxer, to move like a fighter when I'm out on the field. Um, I use a center held round shield. Now I use a very large center held round shield right now because I'm working on some sets from uh, Roland Warzeka, who is my idol right now. I'll end up quoting him probably half a dozen times tonight. So. Uh, He's developed a lot of different concepts on how Vikings use these very large round shields. The round shields in the archaeology, smallest is 30 inches in diameter. They get bigger from there. Um, but I realized that if my shield is strapped to my arm, like a heater, and I used to fight with a heater, and I fought with a kite, I fought with a bunch of different kinds of shields, I can't get this defense out in front of me as well. I have to get this defense in front of me. I had to find different ways to do that. One of the ways to do that without the round shield was to point my sword at somebody. So mm -hmm. I had to go back to the thrusting kick. So sometimes it's just adjust. You have to adjust your equipment to translate stuff over. I would say that adjustment period itself was two or three years of constantly redoing my equipment. Um, I lightened my armor a lot. I fight in minimal, minimal, minimal armor. I have pretty much nothing above the kidney belt. I don't fight with upper legs. I don't fight with upper arms. I really started shedding 
a lot of armor to help facilitate more of a natural movement that you would get from a boxer to, to be able to get into those positions. Um, yeah, every now and then it gives you good incentive to be able to block your legs, that's for sure. But the movement advantage I got out of that was tremendous. So that's a big starting point, I think, and that can be a stumbling block for a lot of guys is that the equipment that they have is going to impede some of their ability to translate some of the martial arts over into this field, especially boxing. So that was a big one for me. So I, I think that answers, I hope that answers your question. No, no, they, totally. Yeah. I, I think that's great. I think it falls right into what Tristan wanted to kind of cover a little bit as well. But first, Tristan, we got a couple of questions. You want to grab the first one? Uh, sure. The uh, talk about what the difference between tourney fighting and uh, sparring and form work is. That one? Or uh, one? I, farther back, too. Is there good, a lot of good questions in here? So. Okay. Well, yeah, just go ahead and, and do that one that you just, you okay. just called um so it, when you do form work and it's in the you know, oriental arts they call it katas but in a, in western boxing you'd be call it working on a heavy bag uh working on your footwork drills anything that's you working on your internal movement like how do you execute your shifts your body weight movements your foot steps your your strikes whatever it is that's that's you just working on your execution you're not watching an opponent for when you do it. You just, when it comes to how you are flushing out how you're going to do your technique and you want to do it with the most efficiency, least least amount of telegraphing, you want to do it automatically. Uh, you want to work on the, that, that kinetic chain when you're delivering power to a target. Uh, so you figure out how to get the maximum efficiency out of your arm, your elbow, your shoulder, your hip. How the hip relates to your your leg drive your hip rotation all of those things that's the minutia of technique execution so you work on that and then you take it to usually not in a whole jump but you start with drills where now you're dealing with a live opponent so now you're trying to read when you would throw your particular technique you're looking to read an opponent know when he's like cocked and loaded and dangerous and when you can get him to shift in such a way that now you have an opening to deliver that attack that you just trained in a kata or trained in a form to, in order to deliver. So you're starting to read an opponent. But the, the thing with sparring is that the ante is low. You don't care if you lose. You don't care if you screw it up. In fact, if you screw it up, you're starting to find where the boundary is. Because remember, we never know a boundary until we cross over it <laughs> when we've gone too far and we, we screwed it up. So oh, we right. learn a lot from failure. So when you're sparring, you're, and I know uh, Sean and, and Bronson talked about this a lot, you're not trying to win practice. You're just trying to understand your tools, understand how you can take your form work and start to put it in terms of a live opponent. And you don't mind if you screw up. In fact, you wanna know what, what is screwing up and what is performing well. I, wanna, I, I used to, there was a joke where I'd be sparring with guys and they'd say, oh, you wanna do best two out of three? I'm like, how about we do three? Oh, you want to do three out of five? How about we do five? I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's two out of three. We're just going to, I'm going to, we're going to, if I win three, we're going to fight two more. Yeah, exactly. Let's just do the five. We'll just right. play it out. It's exactly. just kind of funny. Guys come out with that attitude sometimes. It just makes me laugh. Yeah. <laughs> and, and for anybody that's, that's uh, like learned to play poker or what have you, if you learn to play just for plastic chips, you'll like, I bet a million dollars. You'll just, the game becomes distorted. You're no longer learning just the cards like what the odds of the cards are that's kind of what playing for for fun in poker is you don't really learn poker the nuance of poker till you're playing for money and that's when you start reading people when they start get, start getting worried like am i going to lose a hundred dollars right now that's when having a live opponent that's the equation of in competition that's when it matters that's when all of your other training comes together where you're trying to read your opponent, really trying to manipulate them. You've got high risk. You don't want to lose. And now you have to put all of your tools together in that when it, when it really matters. Um, if does, does that make sense for those? Yeah, two? no, I, I think you covered it kind of A to Z and I think that was important. Uh, and in fact, it's just a, a real quick one that would fall back to you, but you know, the one piece, piece I get whenever I travel anywhere, you know, Europe, uh, I was lucky enough to go to Australia and things like that, is that it's always like the unbelts ask, like, how, how do we compare to everybody else? You know, the, the North Americans, you know, type of deal, because this is where the fighting Mecca is, right? 
Mm-hmm. And, and it's funny, it's, it's not the unbelts that compare. They're, they are identical. Unbelts are unbelts. And, and it's because they're all learning techniques. It's when you hit those upper echelons, when you can't compete and you can't find those sparring partners at your level anymore, that it becomes very difficult to move beyond. And uh, that's really where you see that difference. Um, you know, so that's what sparring and then competition does. One thing I tell all of those people, one of the big, biggest downfalls, and I'll live on this one forever, is that a lot of people become very good and then they are like, okay, well, I just don't want to beat somebody up. So they drop down to that person's level. And now they're never actually ever practicing. They're not practicing to win. And, and so I always, and I'll pull people on the sides and I've told this story before, but I'll pull people on two sides on belts and the knights. And I'll go to the knights and say, Hey, do you guys drop down and practice, you know, just so that every, you don't know, just crush everybody or, you know, how do you handle that? It's like, Oh yeah, I have to drop down. And then I go to your own belts. I go, Hey, you guys know, do these guys have to drop down and practice and they're fighting you at your level and they all get pissed off right? Because they want to see your best game. And if you don't give them their, your best game, they will not, you're going to slow their, their development. So usually what I tell them is like, at the end of your sparring, you do three crown round fights. And that is time. If you're the, 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 the senior guy's role is to be able to hit that guy the same way three times in a row. That day, that guy blocks one of those three, he just made to the next level. Again, day the guy blocks two of those three, he's made it to another level. But it's also, I explained to him is you're going to help them become better because you're going to push them to be competitive again. And I think that's a big part of our sport that we have to understand better. And, and most of that's around communication. You just, all right, we're sparring. All right, these are three crown rounds. I'm going to blow your head off three times in a row. If I can kill you with one shot three times in a row, I don't care. And that's, and, and, and it, it sounds, a lot of people that sounds impassionate, you know, there, there's, you, you're like, well, you shouldn't do that to somebody. This is, this is competition. If you don't do that to somebody, you're shorting him, shorting them the opportunity. So just be aware that I, I live on that, that platform and, and we'll, uh, I'll, I'll let it go back to Tristan from there. Uh, Tristan, I, so that was the question. Um, I think we were just talking uh, a little bit um, you know, especially about the, the inside of that, some of the boxing stuff, you just posted something what, the, the, on, uh, on a couple of things on, on Coach's Corner, which are really good. Yeah, there what was did you get out of those. Favorite, one of my favorite channels on YouTube is uh, the Modern Martial Artist, and it's a young man named David St. Christian or David Christian, and he does breakdowns of all kinds of different boxing from Muhammad Ali to uh, George Foreman, he, he covers not only specific fights, but traits of particular fighters, uh, some that you've probably heard of, and then a bunch that you probably never heard of. I know I've never heard of, but he'll cover Rocky Marciano to Willie Pep and all kinds of names. Most people probably never, never cross their path, but he does these really great breakdowns where he, where he shows about how these boxers will set the, the, the methods that they use to set up their opponents, whether they're using footwork, body shifts, they use attacks to draw attention or to draw a defense the way that they want it. And then they maneuver around to, to exploit it and take advantage of it. Um, and every time I watch one of these, I, I can see the equations because this is what I see in boxing is it's really a chess game. And there's no reason why they call it boxing the sweet science. It's not just two guys out bashing each other's heads. It's maneuvering, luring, using pressure, uh, tempo, timing, all of these components, along with really good footwork to change the positioning, really the optimum positioning. And I think Customato really had this one right, is you want to yeah. get yourself where you can hit your opponent and they cannot hit you. Like what about that statement does not apply to SCA fighting? Like that's, that is the golden rule of all martial arts and, and SCA fighting, definitely one of them. Isn't is, that what all night say? Hit them, don't get hit. Right. Yeah, and but none of them practice it. I'm going to be a dick here. None of them practice it. I, I see way too many times people stepping in constantly on a straight line. You do that in boxing, you're going to lay on the mat. Yep. It's going to be, it's going to be good night. And how many times we see people like on a train track, they walk right up to their opponent and then they kind of back and forth waiting for their opportunity to jump straight ahead and there's no 
offline movement. There's no body turn. There's no uh, stance shift that will lure somebody to a direction. I mean, it's a three-dimensional fight, not a one-dimensional fight. And, so, and but does that not come from the early days of the SCA? Because that's what we were taught. Like, like, and I think that's being perpetuated. And so you guys who are saying, well, hey, let's bring in uh, stuff from other sports, in this case, boxing, where boxing is offline. And, and Tristan, one of the videos that you posted, and I encourage everybody to watch it, at least the one where they draw the Vs, because I could follow that one. The other one, I, I kept forgetting who I was supposed to watch. He would have white shorts and he'd have black shorts and I'd forget and have to rewind. But that's what we were taught. We were taught, it was rock and sock and robots. That, that's the God's honest truth. And I think that because the SCA was kind of insular for a long time, we didn't have a lot of exposure to, the closest thing we had would have been the martial arts, but even that didn't fully come over that I suspect that in the early days, people who were what we would call naturals went, I'm winning, I do this stuff. So we all went, well, that's what they're doing. They win, we'll do that stuff. Yep. And I, I again, Floki, I'll, I'll ask you because you talk about bringing in stuff. Did you get pushback when you first started like going anti-SCA fighting traditions? Very much. Yeah, very much so. Um, and and um, but of course, what happens is it works. Um, one of the things that I began to do, and this is actually something I learned a long time ago before I ever studied anything else. Like I, I my son studies Kali, and he's got an instructor who uh, learned under Dan Inosanto, who's lucky enough to have that influence. Kali, which uses sticks to people in place of blades, works on what's called triangle footwork. And you yes. never approach your opponent in a straight line. You always approach your opponent on a 45. Uh, it doesn't matter which side you're going to go. And they have, you can, you can be at the base of the triangle and your opponent can be between the, or excuse me, you can be at the top at the point and your opponent can be between the two other points or it can be reversed and you're between the two points and your opponent at the point. And then they'll put those into diamonds. Now it's diamond footwork. And then they'll put diamonds together and they'll move across the entire floor in these diagonals. Well, boxing two, this idea that you never approach straight at your opponent. Yes. And when I started to do that, um, I, I didn't get a lot of pushback when I did that because it's immediately effective. It immediately makes a difference. You are moving offline. Your opponent's trying to dominate this center line. If I move off the line that my opponent wants to dominate, I've taken away their advantage. They now have to either turn or move. They have to reposition to adjust to where I have moved. And it's very disconcerting. And I had a lot of comments in early on. People were like, wow, you've got a lot of great lateral movement. I'm not actually moving laterally. No. This is bad. You don't want to just go back and forth because this actually doesn't change my line of attack. It doesn't give me new targets. I need to be moving past my opponent. And, and I got a lot of pushback initially, but it's immediately so effective that some of the upper echelon guys are like, I don't know why you're moving this way or things like that. But a lot of the lower guys will come to me and we came to me and said, you, you need to show me that. What is that? Yeah. What's happening here? Now, I, I, when I come out to fight, it's accepted that we're going to be on, we want to move on these 45s. We don't want to move straight in. That's a fundamental in martial arts. Kali, boxing, Muay Thai, traditional like saber fencing. Again, the idea, even medieval fencing, there are authors who say, I want to move so that I'm looking at my opponent's shoulder or their back. I don't want to be standing right in front of them. I think the reason that in the SCA we began to fight very linearly is because a lot of the early sources that we looked at to get an idea of how we were going to do medieval combat are paintings, drawings, sculpture work from the Middle Ages. And because it's two-dimensional, it looks initially very linear. But when you break it down, you'll actually begin to see there's a great carving from Sicily in the early 12th century, which was the height of the, the Arab Norman period of Sicily under Roger II. 
and it shows two fighters engaged in judicial combat. And they have these egg-shaped shields, and they have these little hammers, because it's judicial combat, of course. And their shields, the faces of their shields, are crossing like this, face to face, like that. That will only occur if you're moving diagonally. That can't occur if you're going straight into each other. This is a universal concept of fighting. This is a fundamental. You never want to go straight into an opponent. You always want to go on the 45. And it can be a little outside 45. It can be a little inside 45. I like going a little inside. I like cutting it a little closer to my opponent because they have less time to react to that because I've closed yeah, this. And they also don't notice it as fast. Right. And they, 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 they're, I'm using their shield to kind of cover my movement. If they have a shield, it's covering their movement. But also remember distance in the fight controls the speed of the fight. And if I yep. can control the speed of the fight, I'm controlling the tempo of the fight. If, I'm cl if I move closer to my opponent as I attack, I'm speeding up my attack and I'm reducing their ability to react. If they're attacking me and I kind of back away, I'm slowing their attack and I'm giving myself more time to react. So it's always better to kind of cut these tight little corners. And you see it in box all the time. Front, a front shuffle step, back shuffle step. Where does yep. it move you? It moves you to the sides. Yeah. Now you have to transition usually into a triangle step to move. You have to kind of step out of the fight in boxing. But that's because the distances in box, boxing are very close. We don't have to worry about too much about that. I don't triangle step out of a fight too much in that boxing stance. So triangle step, again, for people who are like, what are we talking about here? Triangle step is very simple. If I'm in a southpaw stance, right, left foot forward, right foot back, or excuse me, orthodox. I'm in an orthodox stance because I'm a right-handed fighter. If I'm going to triangle step, I'm going to step square. I'm going to step out. You'll find tons of examples of this. Muhammad Ali did it all the time. And in fact, I think he was criticized for it too, because yeah. it looks like he stopped engaging the fight. But he'll, you, if you watch fights, you'll watch Muhammad Ali, he'll be here and he'll come up square. He's still moving his feet, he's still in that shuffle, but he's going completely square. What's happening is, is he's gonna, and now he's gonna try to yeah. yeah, he's gonna go to a front shuffle step or a back shuffle step, and he's gonna come in on the side. It's gonna come in with a really strong hook yeah. to that side. So this idea of, of coming straight in, I think it's a misconception from what the early people in the SCA were looking at. I, we've, I'm lucky enough to be, live in an area where we've got some players who began back in the very, very early 70s. And they talked to me about this. They said, well, look, we just saw pictures of guys like this, and this is what they did. And we just went, well, it has to be like this. And they don't realize that the artwork that you're looking at is not giving you a depiction of actual movement. It's just trying to create a, a sense or a feeling of combat. So I think that's where the problem is. And then it becomes sort of tradition. And the SCA loves tradition. It's married yeah, tradition hard. And this idea that you're going to step outside of that tradition to bring something in that actually, when you look at martial arts from a large spectrum of martial arts, makes perfect sense. There's going to be resistance to it. But it's going to work for you. It will work. It just And that ends it. When it starts being effective, and the younger fighters, the newer fighters, they want to learn it because they're not as married to tradition. That's when it stops becoming an issue. I don't think anybody in this kingdom now, when I say, hey, get on that 45, nobody in this kingdom now looks at me cross-eyed. They go, oh, yeah, yeah, I got to get on that 45. So, yeah, I mean, and, and that's, we cover that a lot, um, <laughs> cover that a, a tremendous amount, actually. And, yeah. uh, but, um, you know, I, I'm going to ask you a few questions. You brought up something earlier about wearing very little armor. I wear mm -hmm. very little armor as well. I went through a period where people are like, oh, that's why you're good. You know, you, I'm sure you get that same thing. Uh, yeah. Understand there's there's trade-offs. And this the, the question there, and I was going to bring it up when you brought it, is you can get away with it. There's trade-offs with lack of armor, even footwear, um, and and speed and and taking a shot. So so just be aware when you're start, when you first start, you you should you could still there's good armor out there that still allows you to move as you get yeah. better. You find better fitting armor and you get, you keep moving that, that, that line and just, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. I started wearing less armor because, and this is not a new fighter kind of 
thought that you should have. I was doing uh, rebated steel combat, not with uh, Battle of the Nations. This was before Battle of the Nations. I was working with some other reenactment groups and we didn't wear as much armor. And I realized yeah. that when I felt more threatened, like, holy crap, if I mess up, this is going to hurt. I was sharper in the fight. That's, I was that's correct. It engaged your mind sharper. Yes. Now, when you start out, you've got so much on your plate that that's not something you need to be concerned about. You need to be safe. Yeah, and you need and to actually, it confident. was an interesting it was an interesting conversation. This kind of comes from a conversation I had with Cybe last night and a couple others. And that conversation was like, and, and what somebody brought up online here was, well, I feel bad when I hit them in no arm. You know, I, I feel bad when I know I'm hitting them at a place where I'm going to hurt them. And it's like, well, they gave, they made, the, they, they created their choice. They don't feel bad hitting you because they're faster than you, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, mm -hmm. So you shouldn't necessarily feel bad about essentially hitting them when they made that choice. Now, yeah. again, this, this is assuming they are wearing what SCA minimum requirements are and all that kind of stuff. You know, if, if they walk out without gloves or without a gorget or something, don't hit them there, but and tell them they have to get stuff on. But it's their choice. If you're worried about their choice, then you're going to lose because you're adding thought in your head and you're, that thought is holding you back even though you don't think it is. Right. If, if you're going into a, let's, let's do the Viking Sagan analysis. You've got training, you've got practice, you've got combat. If you're in combat, you're in a tournament, let's just say crown tournament, and you're fighting somebody who's minimally armored, and they're not really ready for that experience, and you hit them someplace, and they do the crumple, and you are going to feel bad about that hit, you have to understand that that exists exactly. They've made the choice to come out onto the field that day, and they have accepted that as a risk. They've accepted the idea that, that if they get hit there, it's going to hurt. Now, maybe consciously that individual didn't recognize they've made a choice. Maybe they thought, well, I just don't like this piece of armor. I'm going to get rid of it. And they didn't consider that if they get hit there, it's going to hurt. And now that realization is dawning on them. But that is not on you, the person who- That's correct. Them. It never is. It never is. If somebody- 100%. We come out here, we all accept the risk. We know we're going to get injured. We know we can get hurt. I have been knocked unconscious once. I've had a boxer's fracture, ironically in the SCA. I've had, uh, I tore my ACL. I have no ACL on my right knee. So my Muay Thai days are done before they even really got started. I've never, ever, ever blamed the other person for that. Not once. It's always been on me because I went, you know what? I went out with defective armor. I went out, I wasn't paying attention. I should not have done X, Y, and Z. So you never need to feel bad about that. It's okay to be concerned and to feel compassion to somebody who's injured. We never want to injure our opponents because we want our opponents there the next day. Yep. We only progress with opponents, but don't go home and beat yourself up about it. If somebody comes out now in training or practice, you can point out and say, hey, look, you're not wearing upper legs. If I hit you in the leg, this is really going to hurt. This could leave a pretty substantial bruise. Not likely to get a, I don't think that a rattan stick can break a femur. You're not going to end up crippled. You're going to feel crippled for a few days. That's okay. Point it out then. Because that's training and practice. Those are the times where you need to be processing these decisions you've made. But in combat, mm -mm, that's you, no, not the time. You don't have time to think about it. No, don't. And don't. Because if 100%. I had somebody come up to me in a tournament and said, hey, you're not wearing your full legs. Do you want to change your arm before you go out? In combat? That's, I perceive that as a tactic or a strategy. Yeah, that's Undermine a different tactic. My, that's yes. undermining my mental foundation. That's correct. So don't do it in combat. But training and practice, it's perfectly fine to suggest for, to point out to somebody, say, hey, man. And if you're not comfortable hitting him there, don't hit him there. And Lots then tell them, if, 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 and really, if you're not comfortable in, in sparring and practice doing that, if you hit him a couple of times, you're like, hey, bud, I'm not going to throw it to your legs anymore. Uh, yeah. Because, because. I can pretty much hit it at will at this point, and I don't want to cripple you. And that person I, has to make another decision. You know, I, if, he comes, I, if he comes back the following week with no leg harness, his decision. Exactly. I, I have been taking legs and arms as kills since 2010. You mm -hmm. hit me in the leg, I'm done. I don't want a second chance to get it right. 
that's me. And I've had fighters go, why are you taking legs as kills? And I say, and I'll Your choice. And I'll just say, usually I will say, hey, you know what? The short answer is I don't have an ACL in my right knee. So I don't want to go fight on my knees. I can't torque that knee around. Yeah. And they will say, well, I won't hit you in the leg anymore. And I will say to them, well, no. I won't hit you in the leg anymore. They're perfect. But, hey, Tristan, you hit, I'm going to bring back to Tristan here. He had some, uh, he had uh, a topic, I think we, we yeah, you guys made that point it. really well of, you know, of where, you, where you should draw the line of, of basically accepting guilt for somebody else's choices. Uh, and I think everybody needs, that needs to resonate with everybody, but there's something that I wanted to talk about with this idea of, okay, you're going to go with light armor or minimal armor because you'll be just be faster. Cause I think that's, a, that's an overwhelming sentiment no it's not so much that you're that you want to lighten your your armor as much as that you want and Bron has brought this up perfectly you want it to fit well and here's the reason why there is something that happens when your brain when your body feels a pressure and there's a story i was working with a student of mine younger exactly. bigger stronger than me and i close into his chest like i want to take him down but i know he can step backwards so i just reached down and i set my hand on the back of his calf and his leg froze and I just drilled him over and he got up and he said, why did I stop my leg? I know I can step back with more strength with my leg than you have with your hand to stop my leg from what, like, why did I do that? Well, armor does kind of the same thing. If you've got heavy armor that doesn't fit, it's got so much weight laying on your body that your body says you, you can't move right now. It's more of a psychological thing than it is a physical thing. And so this is why, and this goes right back to the practice your form, then practice your sparring, then go to competition. Because you'll see when you practice form without your armor on, and you see how your body moves and you get used to yeah. the, the quickness and, and it's the handling. And now you go from the Ferrari to the pickup truck, because now you put your armor on and you feel all that input. Your brain is starting to say, well, you have to slow down because you have this pressure against you. And then you get armor that fits and your body says, Oh no, I can just move right through it. No problem because your armor is fitting you. And it's not just about how many grams you can shave off of the weight of your armor at all. It's how much is it slopping around on your yeah. knees and your shoulders and or holding you back elbows, you know, all this, the input that you have heavy straps that are laying across your legs or dragging down from your hips because you're, for example, your leg harness is mounted on the front and it's dragging your your belly down with it because all the weight's going straight down the front of your body. All of these things are disasters in terms of what's going on in your the input it's feeding your brain about. Oh my god, I can't move! Like th this is this is horrible. So it's it's fit more than its weight, and but it took me a long time to learn that one. But uh, you know, it, and, and that's the thing. Like leather really is a not much different weight of, than plastic is because everybody thinks plastic is this magical, like there's no weight to it. No, it has weight. Yep. And you know, unless you go to 12 gauge or 14 gauge steel, you know, which is a little bit heavier, but it's not that much heavier. And then of course you sweat and everything gets wet, and now weight is pretty much going to be about the same anyway because you're soaked. Um, so leather also molds to your body. Yes, it fit better. I love leather. Yep. yep. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff about leather. But as you as you go from your and I would encourage you do hell work, do form practice without your armor on, and then go do the same thing with your armor on. And, and notice the difference in how your body has to adjust. I mean, even the weight of gauntlets uh, is enough to change the form of your sword shot. Uh, and so feel that extra weight of your gauntlets. Uh, when, as you as you go through and practice your form, um, and this is something that boxers don't have to deal with. Yes. They're wearing shorts and gloves, and yeah. that's it. So they can be very agile. So just notice as we're the show is about comparing kind of the influence of modern martial arts and into um, into SCA fighting. We do have some constraints that are unusual. One of them also being helmet. You'll notice boxers bobbing their head and dropping low. You can't do that with a helmet on. That's just not in the cards. But the principle of, of doing level changes where you drop your whole body, you keep your head up, but you use your legs to sink and use right. that level change. Right. You can yeah. use those tools uh, and to great effect, even using the glancing surface of your helm to shift your head. What a boxer would do like a head shift, 
you can tip and get a glancing surface where there wasn't a glancing surface with your head straight up. Well, and let's even let's even talk about in boxing, right? Hands up, chin down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm looking at my opponent under my eyebrows. Mm -hmm. Same principle here. Mm -hmm. Put your chin down. Right. And what happens is, is this these two flat planes, they're now perpendicular to a sword strike. They're not as perpendicular anymore. Get that head down, chin down, hands up. And look where I'm at. If I have a heater in this hand and I have a basket on this hand, it's not, I'm going to adjust for a heater like this, but we're really here. We're really right here. The head and hand position in boxing, again, excellent for SCA. Get this chin down, tuck that chin in. Talk about strikes to the gorget, right? People worry about getting stabbed in the throat. Get your chin down. Get that chin down and get this in. And now, I'm doing this. Now I can do this. This is something I can do in a helmet. That's about it. I can't do popcorn head movement in a helmet. Right. But I can be here. And I can be here looking at around the hands, keeping the defense up. For Muay Thai guys, I'm almost, it's, it's double pillar, obviously double pillar, which is this defense. Yep. Not going to work in SCA. But hand position's almost the same. With my sword on my shoulder, my hands pretty close to my chin, and I'm here. Right? What's the? I can never remember. Oh, oh. What's, the, the, what's the guard here? I can't do it on the camera. Are you talking the Philly shell? Philly the shell. shell. <laughs> yeah, Philly shell, man. Look at the Philly shell. How they do that? It's a perfect. You've got a shield. It's not working exactly on the same principle. But if I take that shield off your arm, you you can be in the Philly shell position. If you watch boxers who use these techniques, and if you get up and just Replicate them. And let's be honest, go box, go get some 16 ounce gloves, go find a heavy bag someplace, you know, fill a duffel bag with old clothes, whatever you gotta do, box a little bit, feel that movement, get that in. Because when I was, when I was adapting boxing over to SEA, I boxed, we, we boxed 16 ounce mitts, man. That's that's a weight on your arm. Oh yeah, well it's a great workout, right? I mean, oh yeah, and it's funny. It's funny because I I adjust. Uh, you know, I I took the and I'm going to show a, a real quick clip for everybody. Um, but I, you know, I took that Eastern European. I was a big Triple G, G fan, big Lomo fan. Um, you know, Lomo was Lomachenko was known across every sport for his movement. So I'm going to show a real quick clip here for everyone. Let's see if uh, let's see how well I do this. Uh, let's see, share screen. And there it is. All right. And share. All right. So here's it's 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 not a super long clip, and we're not gonna show it all, but um, you know, some of the things. Oh, come on now. Of course, he doesn't want to start. I'm frozen. So while we're waiting for that, all right, I was frozen. I'm I'd like to encourage everybody because you guys have been talking terms. That Philly thing is this interkingdom anthropology or is that a boxing thing? That is a that's, boxing term. That's okay, a boxing I wasn't term. Sure. Yeah. Okay. If you if you go on YouTube and just put in Philly shell. It's going to bring up guys and you will immediately see it because I can't really do it. But instead of in, in, in most in boxing, you've got, you want your hands kind of married on your chin. And when I box, I want to come right back to my chin. Philly shell. What I'm doing is I'm protecting my forward arm usually with my shoulder. I'm pulling my chin down into my shoulder and my hand is really low. Like um, below his belt low. It should be like almost right in front of his groin. Well, and, yeah. and you're looking at like, uh, you know, you can see a couple of people do that. Muhammad Ali did it. So yep. did um, Mary Weather made a yeah. career of it. So you'll see it and it'll instantly for anybody who's fought in the SCA for more than nine months, you're going to go. Okay, it, and by the way, if you about. search for Philly shell, it's P-H-I-L-L-Y. Like Philadelphia. Yeah, like yeah Philly. Philadelphia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it'll pick up you'll pick it up really quick and, and, and you'll see it. You'll see it. it, it it's, 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 it's instantly recognizable to SCA fighting because for some guys, um, maybe not guys with heaters, maybe guys whose shields not strapped at 10 and two guys who are maybe with a strap round where it's more horizontal, you're going to go, Oh, 
oh, you're going to see this position. You're going to see how this works. But these head positions that you get in boxing, when you're tucking into the shoulders, you're bringing everything in. Another big one is also elbows. I criticize guys for this. Nobody boxes like this. No. You may see guys on the speed back pull those elbows in. Well, you got to be careful and don't, but your elbows no. aren't at your sides. Not quite, no. But no. Keep the elbows down. Yes. You know, you want to keep them down. They're in front of you. Your yeah. hands are up, but your elbows are down. Your elbows I do are that down. when I'm drinking coffee. So <laughs> it's easy. Ah. No, but seriously, like it's easy when you're drinking. Here's my thing to do this. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I practice when I'm drinking doing it that way. I've done it for years and it's that's kind of, awesome. It's I love just, it. It's a little thing to do, but just to remind you about where your arms are. Bronis, I know you're going to show us a video or you're going to try to do it again. Yeah. Bronis is queuing this up. One of the things I noticed that uh, on the videos that Tristam posted, it was a boxing video for boxers. Sorry about that. Okay. I'm, I'm going to just go ahead and finish a little bit of this and then I'm going to get back to you, Beth. Okay. So take a look at Lomo here. He's. Wait, you know, we, which one is he? <laughs> well, in this case, it's neither of these guys. Okay. <laughs> um, although that could be, no, that's Lomo in the blue. It's his younger days, I'm thinking. Is he now that's Lomo in the, in the, the dark green. Okay. Watch his movement. See how he shifts right into a side. This is what what Floki was talking about as well. He's falling in and, and dropping into into those corners, but he's not. Okay, so not hang on a second, Ronis. Hang on. Him. Like you're saying, watch him. But here's my question: What am I watching? Am I watching his upper body? Am I watching? So, his so watch feet? watch how he ends up position angles against his opponent. Okay. So his opponent's body. He'll literally be square on his opponent, but his the opponent's shoulders will be in his. So watch him shift to the side. See now his uh, opponent okay. even turn towards him. Watch. You're gonna there he goes. He see how he's see how he's on the side. He turns the guy and then he shifts back. Really, you want to watch this? I we used to do this all the time. We used to watch all these fights and just kind of critique what we were seeing. You don't want to watch this more than once you're going to watch it once you're going to look at the feet when you can see the feet then you're yes. going to go back and want to watch it again you're going to want to watch where the elbows are where the upper body is exactly. then you're going to want to watch head movement because you really can't watch it all at once in one video you're going to really want to break it down and you're going to end up watching these videos over six and over or seven times at minimum and we used to do this all the time we used to sit and watch um Klitschko was the guy we oh yeah yeah sit and watch all the time. although not not terribly yeah. fascinating unfortunately no he's like but it's very easy to see what Klitschko does because it's relatively yeah. slower because he's a heavyweight exactly well, that's exactly why we would watch Klitschko um uh but you know you're gonna watch it several times because you're you're gonna want to watch different things but I always recommend when you first start watching these videos and you're trying to get an idea of how to incorporate some of these movements always start with the feet. It's the base of the kinetic chain. Yep. If a boxer's feet aren't working, nothing's going to work. So if you can't watch it more than once, watch the feet. That's the key. So, you always got to so, watch feet. So watch in here. Look, look at, you know, this is one of these cases. He's totally behind him. But look at his eyes. I mean, he is on. He has gazed on that opponent almost all the time. He's always, look at that gaze. Yep. And, and look at this. If you had somebody in this position behind your shoulder, is this where you would want to fight from? <laughs> exactly. I mean, you can see what happens there. He can't throw a blow because offensively, he's faced somewhere else. His hips can't be engaged. His feet can't be engaged. His can shoulder you, is behind him. Can you back up a frame to that position where L Lomancheco was behind? Right there. Okay. What you need to know about boxing rules it's illegal to hit somebody in the back of the neck, back of the head, back of the shoulders, back of the kidneys. That entire back target is wide open and none of it's it. legal target area. So now in terms of SCA fighting, oh, he can. <laughs> all of that's legal. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Hopefully you would be, there. yeah, you'd be striking into that back the minute you got that position. It would be like that. And in fact, this is this that. is one of those footworks that uh, that Tyson used. Look at that. And 
And what he would do is he'd throw the right hand out to right into somebody's face. So they got a big boxing glove right in their eyes. Then he'd do that diamond step off to the, yeah. off to the side and he would get so deep that he would start to hit the kidneys. So Customato had to had to shorten that step so that Tyson didn't go so far behind that he'd, he'd land a, that hook punch in the kidneys. He had to land it right on the side of the body. So that- And then he would that, switch to the other side and throw the same thing. Right, yep. And, and then and, he would go down, down and up or up and down. And as soon as somebody got hit in the kidneys, they'd lower their elbow and then the head was and open. He, Kabam. Exactly. Well, you got to watch the way Tyson even just moves in the fight. He is constantly shifting weight. Yep. Every step is shifting his weight so well, that he can begin to throw right as he steps. And again, that hand and Tyson is always leading that foot. His whole movement's designed to be able to get into those positions and land those super powerful shots. I, so think I, I, have, to, I have to say, I've been fighting for 30 years. And when I watch the boxers, they're really good, I mean, obviously, and they make these subtle movements. As a fighter for 30 years, I feel like I should be able to watch this and to see them all immediately. And Floki, I know you say watch them several times, and trust me, I do, but I still feel as I watch them that there's so much subtleties going on oh, that there I don't is. know. And Tristan, on the videos that you posted, like, thank God the guy's drawing the, like, the lines for the feet. Like, when they used to show hockey and they'd have the line for the puck so you Americans could see where the puck was going. <laughs> um, but they also talk about things like, oh, he's doing a shuffle step and he's doing a that step. And it's hard if you to watch what you don't know. So I would encourage people who before they watch these or if they're talking, they hear a lot about like a shuffle step. You can Google, because I just did. <laughs> so I could tell you this. What is a boxing shuffle step? And then they'll show you what the shuffle step is so you know what you're looking at, so you can see what you're watching. And I, and think I bet you, Beth, you Googled it. I bet you you Googled it, and they were like, oh, I do those on Sundays. Well, I do, Broadus, and I was lucky <laughs> because, because I have the experience, right? But if, if I, had, I get you. But, but two years ago, man, if you had said to me, hey, watch this, best and, and check out the shuffle step, I'd be like, I know, what? I agree. So I, I really do encourage people to, to take up, before you start watching boxing videos, learn just the very basics. And that's okay. Yeah. Because look at these men who are here who are telling you who have had great success incorporating the boxing and the martial arts. And they're telling you these things work. So you can watch a video, but you don't know what you're seeing. Listen to what they're saying. Listen to the words that they're using and find it and, and watch so, and then incorporate that. Sorry, that's so I'm gonna go back real quick because that people are probably like, this is one of those times when people are like, what is he doing here? And what he's doing is he's making decision making. They, they announce a number and he has to touch it. The idea is quick decision making. Uh, decision making is no different than building physical quickness and, and, and uh, prowess. You're using your mind, you can practice decision making faster and faster. And the idea here is he's doing that here. And, and so he's, that's why he's doing this exercise. Not a lot of people do this, but that's part of the mental discipline piece. This is also one of those things, and this goes right back to our, that episode, Need for Speed, where we talked about mental, mental speed. When his eyes see something, his hand goes to where the that's target is. Right. So he, he builds that, that automatic response of when the eye spots hand follows and that's a simple way to do it that's easy on his body he doesn't wear it's not like he's punching a moving target all the time but it's uh, not meant, it's not meant to be a punching form exercise it's a it's a brain development exercise so here's here's an example he's he's throwing a lot of jabs in this next example you'll see this pop up um so he's throwing a lot of just quick jabs none of them are made to really hurt somebody but what those are check jabs so what he's looking is for what his opponent does He's throwing those check jabs. He's waiting for his opponent to cover his face, and then he's going to shift to his side and throw. Mm -hmm. You can absolutely do this in the SCA as well. Absolutely. In fact, one of the things is he's got that bright colored glove, and he puts it right oh, up. Oh yeah. So now that if you look at it from the the other the opponent's standpoint, now he's got something right in his face, moving around. Now he's not seeing the body shift as much. Well, this translates perfect SCA fighting because. 
you throw a thrust or a quick shot to somebody's face, their shield comes up. Now they're looking at the back of their shield. You move behind it, and you, it, now you're using the shield like he's using the boxing glove. That's um, correct. There's my favorite. Boss. Oh, yeah. yeah. Little Boss Rutan, that's my <laughs> go-to guy. Yeah. I, I encourage guys, when they start to use thrusting tips, to make sure that they put a bright color on the end of that tip. They go, oh, I don't want guys to know I've got it. I'm like, yeah, yes, you do. Yes, you do. You want them to see that tip. You want them to be focused on that tip. When that tip thrusts forward, you want them to react in some kind of uncontrolled manner. They need to see it. It's not something you want to conceal because it's just going to set you up and you want a bigger out of control movement. Same thing with a jab. Boxers know they're going to get a lot of jabs coming at their face, but the cleaner, the crisper the jab and the more threat that that jab has, the better the setup with the other hand. And so if you're going to go out there and try to not, you don't want to really commit to the thrust, you might feel bad about thrusting and you want to start adapting some of these techniques over, put something nice and bright on the tip. You're, I, I, I don't know what it is in the kingdom. I think the rule is here that you have to have a third color on the tip. It has to be marked as a thrusting tip. And I encourage guys, I'm like, mark it out. Let them see it. Let them see it. Let them see that there. They need to know that that's a threat that they've got to react to. And that's the way you get those setups. What's interesting is, is when you look at the medieval manuscripts, most cuts begin as thrusts and then translate over to a cut. It's the same principle here. That jab hand moves your opponent. They have to react to it. Because again, I, I can't remember who has actually done a KO with a jab. I think Tyson has done pretty close to a KO with a jab. It's not common to do a KO with a jab. Most guys who box know that that KO, that yeah, triple, hand, triple D, triple G, you know, a, a yeah. KO with a jab, a KO with a jab is usually a straight punch. Yeah, exactly. It's just usually a straight. Yeah. Uh, but you take enough jabs to the face, you're in trouble. Because again, obviously boxing is being scored and you don't want to be taking those hits, but over time, that's going to wear you down. Those jabs still hurt. So you want to be able to, you got to react to that jab. It's the same thing with, that's why I, it's what I do with my thrusts. I make guys react to that thrust. I make them see it because I'm going to be moving while they react. I'm going to be stepping offline. I'm going to come in straight at a distance, again, I'm going to be fighting at wide distance. We haven't really talked too much about distances yet. I'm going to be starting at a wide distance. Wide distance, the way I translate it, is from fencing theory. I'm about six inches off the longest attack my opponent has. doesn't matter if it's a nine-foot spear or a dagger. I want to begin my attack six inches off that tip. And at that distance... I get that a little extra tempo to make that to, to cause that reaction. I can get my opponent to react while they're reacting to what attack I as I come forward, right into this closer range. I can move offline because they're reacting. Tempo is I do something, you do something. So as I step That's into correct. the fight, as I step in, I attack. I'm going to step and attack at the same time. You're going to react to my attack. That's your turn. You've used your tempo to react to my attack. And in boxing, that's a jab. If I jab and you react and you to defend, the jab. Yep. Yeah. If I rotate like this to a jab, I'm open up. I'm going to get blasted, blasted in the side with, an up, with, a, with a cross. If that's I rotate right. like this or whatever, however I react. Same thing here. If I react to this initial attack as I come in, I'm making you react. I'm going to step. My next foot movement is going to be offline. At the same the time. Line. Yep. Yep. I'm going to try to do all of these in a single tempo. I'm going to try to which, do three things in one beat. Which is very difficult. So I'm going to, I'm just point, I'm going to change it over to Tristan in a second because he had something. I'm just going to point out you're, you're talking to people who are integrating these things within their last five, maybe 10 years of fighting. Everything from tension control to to integrating tempo and all of those pieces in a in a spot in their fighting that they really understand it. And yeah. it's, it's not easy. If you find a good no. trainer, they, they can help you with this. Um, but most people don't understand it. Best can understand because we've been, we've been practicing every Sunday and that's something we train and it's very complex. But 
um, just beware, there's opportunity. It's up to you to find and make that opportunity. Tristan. Yeah, so we had a really great question uh, from one of the listeners about um, what are some other head movement drills besides the, oh, slip, man. Tons of them. Besides the slip rope drill. Um, and I think the slip rope drill is the one they're talking about where you run a cord and it should be yeah, right, we used about to do it. It, right about at nose level or right about at mouth yeah. level. You start with your head on one side. So like the, your ear yeah. is almost up against the cord. You drop down underneath and come up on the other side. And then usually you'll throw kind of a shot and then you come down underneath the rope. So you're sort of ducking underneath the rope. And this and what Bess was talking about earlier, boxing tends to have its own uh, terminology, the same way SCA fighters talk about rising snaps and J strokes and nobody else knows what in the world we're talking about, but we do because that's our thing. Well, what this is, is a, a, called a level change. And so I found the level change to be invaluable when it can, comes to protecting your all the time without having to throw, commit your shield up, which blinds you and it, and it opens your leg or committing your sword over, which is now if it blocks, now it, it's not hitting. So one way to get the drop step, and, and if you imagine yourself doing a squat, stand up normally, and now you do, do a slow squat down, and you want to get your head an entire head length below where your head would normally be. So the top of your head would be where your chin is. Like that's how far you want to drop with a level change. Only with what? only the form is a squat, but you're not dropping slow. You nope. want to free fall. You want to like your imagine picking your feet entirely up, up off the ground and let your body free fall because that's the fastest. Thank you for way thank you for saying that, Tristan, because people yeah. don't understand that well enough. Right. Well, I wanted to describe the form, and the form is I love be, it. You keep your head up, like you and you lower your butt down, but because you lower your butt, your head's going to go with it, right? So when you when you drop, you don't want to look down or or try to bob your head down without lowering your body, right? So. Pick up your feet and free fall down to the point where the top of your head is where your chin was at. That's going to be a good level change. Now, I like doing it when I step out a little bit with one foot and then I come up in the new spot. So the, my trailing foot steps in because you never want to come right back to where you just started from because more stuff could be headed right where, where you were. So it's good to be able to move. So that's a good drill to do to just yeah practice. I do that as part of a drop step actually yeah and that the second one is now add do the same thing with a drop step because yeah and you can experience a drop step if you keep your knees bent a little bit and you just pick up one foot and you'll fall that way well that's the drop so that's the fastest way for your body to move off the line is to pick that foot up and let it drop when you place your foot down to stop the drop you can adjust how far down you want to go so you can use it with a level change. So you drop your head. And I love doing this because it, it did such a great job. As soon as I saw somebody throw, I drop step, head would drop. I, the sword would usually go sailing over my head. And I was deep enough that I could easily throw to the leg or to the butt or to the back uh, or even to the head. Wrap. It's a great response in either direction. Yep. As long as you have no hesitation. That it, there can be zero. Like once you see that go and you pick up the foot, you you should fall that way, and then you can you know you can adjust how far you of a, a deep of a level change you want to do. But can I boy, can I, I can I go ahead? It. It just made my add, really hard to uh, hard to get hit. I just yeah. want to add one thing to what Tristan's saying too. If you notice what he's talking about, when he's talking about doing that slip, I see this a lot. Of mistake, a very common mistake with head slip with guys in the SCA. Love he's talking about to the outside of the blow. Mm -hmm. that direction i see guys do really great head slips inside and then when they reach come back up pow Bang, slip yep. outside you want to come underneath so if i'm looking at my opponent and my opponent's right-handed and he's throwing a flat snap i'm going to come underneath and i'm going to come up on his right side the and your whole gonna, body shifts the whole body's right. got to move the whole body and that's why i love what tristan's saying too about it being the legs it's in the legs these slips are not, I'm not just bobbing my head. That's not going to mm -hmm. do it. Yeah. It's in the legs and I'm coming to the outside. That was a huge thing for me when I was learning to head slip. And when you get that right for the first time, you're going to see a world of targets for about a half second. And you'll just stand there and go, holy cow, it'll really open your eyes. But yeah, and, he, and Tristan, you showed it coming to the outside. I just want to make sure guys understand you want to slip to the outside of that blow. You don't want to be on the inside. 
you want to be as that blow needs to be moving away from you as you do that slip. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yep. Um, All right. Um, what, Chris and I, I what I would say is, is as you're doing drills to move your head, always remember, make your feet move your head. Don't lean. Don't, you know, try to use your abdomen. Don't use your neck to move your head. Use your legs and your feet. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to throw one at you on that one just real quick. Um, and then unfortunately folks, we could probably go another hour on this and I have every one of these things that they were just talking about, I actually have some video for, I, I did a class. I am going to put that document of my class out, which has a lot of YouTube video of boxing stuff on it. Uh, I will touch base with Floki and with Kristen and Bess, if you have some too, that you really enjoy, I'm going to get some other video and I'll include that on that document. Um, and uh, we'll post that up uh, shortly after our episode. Um, I actually, for tension control, I do use head fake. So in other words, I'll stick my head in there and I'll take my head off. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the reason I can do that is when somebody, I can push pressure, I can, you, you see, I'm like, I'm pushing pressure on either side of your head and I take it away, let you relax for a second and I push it back in. And what that does is it, it's changing constant tempo and pressure on an opponent, which restricts your breathing a lot of times. So, so, you know, that's tension control, which is a whole different animal. A lot of people don't understand how to use tension to control against opponents. Uh, and I, I can guarantee you, we've practiced it for years. I've seen Ron Galder make somebody throw up because he put so much tension on them uh, shortly after dinner that uh, it did not stay down. Um, so the, the idea is there are head stuff that you can do. And, 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 and you do those things to shock or to essentially cause your opponent to have to think. And that will cause them to sometimes essentially freeze uh, but most of it applies tension in our body. Uh, when you really get to that point where, you know, there, there's some really, really detailed points with eye blinks and stuff like that. I used to do it specifically when people were breathing out, I, I pushed back in on them. So they sucked that bad air back into them, which depleted their body of oxygen. And slowly they were getting, I've had people just quit. I've never had to hit them. They're like, I'm done. I can't go. Because they start feeling sick. They start cramping up. <laughs> You know, any of those things because they just have no control over, they, they're essentially starving themselves of oxygen. So, you know, there's lots of layers and, and Eastern European boxing uses tension control all the time. That's why you see Lomachenko hanging in there, but he's putting himself right in a position on the side of the guy's body where the guy's freaking out. He was just in front of him. Think of how much energy and tension you have in your body when somebody disappears and, and is in a space that you have no defense against. And then when you turn there, he's in a different space. That tension is so high, you never get a chance to breathe. And it's, it's an incredible thing to do. Whole different high level of the game. Not a lot of us think about it. It, it was fun to, to really dive into that for years. Uh, and, and really, it's why, you know, as an old man, I can still wear out young guys. So, <laughs> but anyways, we're, we're running pretty late. Uh, Floki. I, you know, I, we could stay on for another couple hours to talk about this. This is, this is my I, passion. I can talk about fighters. I've got so many favorite fighters. I mean, like I said, I, <laughs> don't even, if we want to do a video about Boss Rutten sometime and just talk about Boss Rutten, I can talk for hours. It's, it's, I could go on forever. I, I agree. And, you know, maybe, maybe that's one thing we do is we, we all grab some clips of our favorite boxers and what they're doing and then just bring it. Yeah. You know, yeah. let's talk about what, how it's transitioning into the SA. More talk, just here's what they're doing. Right. We can't, nobody can bring Muhammad Ali though, because it'll just be like two hours of everybody bringing Muhammad Ali. <laughs> somebody else. He's oh, off I, I bring Lomo way before. There but, you go. Okay. I don't know. Ted, I got, it's funny because you were talking about head slips, Tristan and Tyson. I, right now I have like four or five windows open on Tyson videos because I was going to teach a head slip class. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Tyson almost head slips like every time he steps, he's doing like some yeah, oh, hundred percent. Yeah, and, and he's and never on level. It's interesting too because the way Tyson does, uh, you know, he's taught to do it one way, and uh, but he has a bad habit of looking down when he's doing them sometimes. Yeah, he does. Uh, but if you look how he's when he's practicing, he's keeping his eyes up, and then when he's in fighting, he tends to get a little bit of bob. But yeah, but uh, yeah, it's uh, you know, it, it's all great stuff, and there's lots of stuff to learn here, and that's what we really really just wanted to give everybody a chance 
to think of something different. And I think, you know, Bess, you, this is a whole new world for you and you're, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Now uh, you're, you're mute. It is, uh, it was hard. You know, I'd done something for 30 years one way and I have to unteach my body and relearn, but I am enjoying it. And it's, a, it's as much mental as it is physical. So I, I encourage everybody to give it a go uh, and stick with it. I literally at times would have to like, when I was doing leg work, have to pick up a leg and go now. Now you go here and this <laughs> leg goes here because my body was like, no, I don't do that. <laughs> so I, I encourage everybody, give it a go. And, and the best part about this, and this is the reason why we're here and we're trying to help everybody and we pull in people like Floki and, you know, and, and other guests is because we want to educate people. The more education we have in the society, the better martial art we will be. We have a great opportunity to be, we, we, we are, a, you know, 80% fighting sport. Not a lot of sports are that way, right? Or not a lot of martial arts are that way. Uh, that's good or bad, but we have a, if, if everybody understands better, then everybody's going to teach better and everybody will understand from earlier levels. And then we just become a better society, a better martial arts group. And, and it's, it becomes an amazing thing. So, um, you know, that's, that's why we're here. That's why we've been doing this. Floki, I, I thank you a ton, man. I, I, we're going to pull you back in. We're going to do that boxing video thing. All right. I'm there for it. I'm here. For I think it's going to be awesome. Tristan, yeah. you, you were there for it? You'll be in. Yep. <laughs> I think it would be very cool. Um, and uh, for everybody else that came out, thanks. Uh, thanks a ton. You had, you had some, a couple of really good questions. There was some good talk on, uh, you know, hey, uh, we're going to post some stuff up. If you have other great videos you like after I post my spreadsheet up, um, you know, uh, Post, post a comment and why you like it because, uh, uh, I, you know, I always love watching good boxing videos. So, uh, and it's a great way to help others on the site and everybody, uh, everybody uh, gets a chance to help everyone else there, including the, the great coaches that we have. I guarantee you Floki hasn't watched every video out there. Well, maybe not. I don't know. He's, he's pretty tough. So I don't know. There's no way I've watched every video out there. <laughs> guarantee it. <laughs> guarantee it. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, thanks for everybody. Uh, but before before we wrap her up, Tristan, what do we got next week? We have next week coming up the uh, Heroes and Traditions of the Mid Realm Part Two. Uh, hey, I might actually make this episode. I mean, my name might come up. <laughs> <laughs> it might. <laughs> yeah, Sir Bronis watched the fight where this great guy did a thing. <laughs> 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 oh so uh it's it's gonna be great stuff um uh, it, it's interesting i've been really enjoying watching those because i get to learn more about sca and and some of the great early people that came out of the sca and uh and the history of the sca it's incredible uh, i look forward to the artemisia ones too because there's there's some really cool stuff and uh, that's not too far off actually so yeah, we've got um, we've got some uh we got some great hitters back in our ancient past yeah, you couple, do. A couple guys. Yeah. A couple guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but uh, on that note, um, I, again, thanks everybody for coming out. I hope uh, we keep seeing you. I hope, uh, I hope everybody gets to get to more events now. Uh, it's nice to have kind of the, the SCA back a little bit and, and now we can push forward. We're going to try to keep going as long as we can. Uh, we may have some points here and there that uh, we switch some days and things. Just because coaches are going to start hitting the more events, uh, we we had uh, another coach that just won a cornet tourney, uh, so a huge call out for Helga there, and uh, and uh, you know our, a lot of our coaches have been busy sitting thrones here and there, so um, you know those guys know what they're doing. I can still be here, so it's all good, <laughs> and uh, we'll we'll look forward to seeing you and uh, have a great weekend. Stay safe. Bye, folks. Good night, everybody. Good night. Been fun. Thank you, guys. All right, man. Bye, everyone.